There's a lot of discussion in our country and especially in our state and promotion of a Article 5 convention and what many are calling a convention of the states. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of wishful thinking. And uh, we wanted to provide some information to not only our members, but to the constituents here in Tennessee, to Tennessee residents. Uh, we had an event planned early on with a couple people from Tennessee, along with the uh, uh, lead for the Convention of the States um, group, but uh, they declined to come because they know that they can't stand up under scrutiny. So we went and we uh, uh, looked for another possible uh, person to speak on behalf of what is the truth behind the Article 5. If you pick up your Constitution, Article 5 is not that long. And there's a lot of things that are not said, and a lot of the stuff that's being said about it is speculation. Uh, it's an expectation that we're going to follow a plan, a new plan that's developed by these people versus the old plan that's already been established. So uh, we were able to secure a national leader in this area uh, to talk on behalf of this, to give us the information. And then to discuss about our state has already passed a balanced budget amendment, uh, which is a call for a convention. And he can, we'll get into it a little bit later on. If as he talks fast and we listen fast, uh, we'll be able to understand why that's a bad idea and how either uninformed our state representatives are or how, uh, how in line they are with the groups that are pushing this. So with, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Fry, and Richard is here um, on his own accord. We have only paid for his flight to get here. So uh, I think that says a lot about who Richard is and what his goal is. It's not to get rich on going around giving these conferences. It's about getting the information out and leading an effort to restore our nation based on sound principles. So, I'd like to introduce Richard Fry. Thank you. We're running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to try to go uh, fairly quickly. Um, maybe I won't go so quickly. Okay, this is what we want to cover today. I want to go over the nature and character of the federal government, the Article 5 amendment process, which is the actual process that, that they are trying to invoke to do the amendment, the history of the current uh, Article 5 movement, and then the, talk about the current promoters of the Article 5. Uh, during the course of this, I'm going to refer to sovereign citizens or CEPAs, the uh, citizen sovereignty. And I just want everybody to understand, there is a group out there, it's an anarchist group called Sovereign Citizens. Sometimes they refer to themselves as common law citizens. That is not what we're referring to. When I refer to a, a sovereign citizen, I'm referring to that in the same sense that the founders referred to it. Okay? So, just so we don't get confused on that. Really, there's only one question that, that you need to ask yourself and the answer to decide that this is a good idea or a bad idea. Everything else is not relevant, whether it's the rules of the convention, and who picks delegates, and what amendments, th that is not really relevant. And I'm going to cover some of that because I think it relates to the credibility of the people that are promoting this. But the only question that you need to ask yourself is, why should we believe that changing the Constitution is going to make uh, corrupt politicians who have been violating their sacred and solemn oath to support the Constitution to suddenly start supporting this amended Constitution. How is amending the Constitution going to turn corrupt politicians into statesmen? I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but that's what people want you to believe. 
The Article 5 Convention, it's the wrong solution to the wrong problem. Should we be amending the second of the, or the Ten Commandments because people don't want to follow them? And if your wife is going to cheat or your husband is going to cheat on you, do you want to amend your wedding vows because of that? If they're not going to uphold the Constitution now, why would they want to uphold the Constitution later? That's Good. the issue. Okay, now this is going to give you a background to kind of understand some of the issues that the promoters are trying to say. One of the issues is that this Article 5 is going to rein in and control the federal government. And we're going to show you that that's not the case. That's not how our system is set up. Okay, what we have here is a depiction of what the federal government really is. A lot of people want to refer to the central government in Washington, D.C. as the federal government. That is not the federal government. The federal government is composed of the central government, the states, which are represented by the petals of this sunflower, and then we, the people, uh, as the outer water, if you will, of, of the federal government. Okay, where, do, where are the citizens, or why do I want to include the citizens in the government? In the Declaration of Independence, it says, to secure these unalienable God-given rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. The Tennessee uh, Constitution says that all power is inherent in the people, and all free government, governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, etc. The definition of sovereign is an entity that is self-directed and self-governed. It has absolute control over its own internal operations and its operations or relationships with other entities. That's the definition of sovereignty. And we are sovereign in this country. We're the only country in history where the people are considered the sovereign. It's like the king. You don't have a government where there's a king that's not part of the government. That's why the people are part of the government, because we are the sovereign. This is what James Madison said in Federalist 45 about the makeup of our government. The state governments may be regarded as constituent and essential parts of the federal government, whilst the latter is no wise essential to the operation or organization of the former. The federal government wouldn't exist, uh, the central government would not exist if it were not for the states. The states do not depend upon the central government for their existence. They're sovereign as well. Okay, and this is a depiction, another depiction of how that uh, would operate. Okay, the supremacy clause, and this is going to set the background again. Uh, this is this, what's called the supremacy clause, and I also, what I call it is the automatic nullification clause. This Constitution and the laws of the United States, uh, which are made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties, etc., which are under the authority of the United States, will be the supreme law of the land. So the Constitution is unqualified, the law of the land. But only those, those federal enactments which are pursuant to the Constitution are the supreme law of the land. All right? And there's two requirements for that. They have to fulfill the procedural requirements of the Constitution. Uh, both houses have to sign off on the legislation, and then it goes to the president. If it goes from the House to the president and back to the Senate, it doesn't work. If appropriations aren't started in the House, it doesn't work. Uh, if the president starts it, it doesn't work. The other requirement is that it substantively uh, complies with the Constitution. And what that means is that the, the actions taken by that legislation are within the enumerated powers, primarily Article 8 or Article 1, Section 8. But there are other powers in the Constitution. But that's what this says. And what happens is if that's not the case, then the enactment is not, does not become law. <coughs> what ties the federal government together? Before any public servant <coughs> can assume the office or require to take two separate oaths. Most of them don't understand this. The first is an oath of office that relates specifically to the office they're going to hold. The second one is the oath to support the Constitution. Okay, and 
And I'm going to go over the oath and to support it's in Article uh, 6, Clause 3. And what it says is, the federal senators and representatives before mentioned, and again, they're talking about the federal uh, or the central government ones, and members of the several state legislature and all executive and judicial officers, both in the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. So, in essence, Every state and central government officer are a federal officer. They're bound to support the Constitution. The president is likewise bound, but he's bound by a separate oath. And that oath was written specifically by the founders. And his oath is to protect, uh, preserve, and defend the Constitution. They're very specific. Uh, the actual oath is left up to the states or the legislature, the federal legislature, to prepare. But regardless of what they, they say, how they want to phrase it, this is the responsibility that they have. Okay. Now what does this oath do? It establishes a personal duty to that person. The oath is an active and affirmative duty. It's not a passive duty. So what that means is it's not enough that you don't violate the Constitution. That's not enough. You have to defend the Constitution. If it's attacked, you have to defend it. So if someone's trying to pass uh, legislation that's not constitutional, you've got to be involved. It's unlimited geographically and politically. That's not true for the oath of office, right? The oath of office is limited geographically and politically. It's also a perpetual duty. It lasts as long as you live. Now, most military people understand this. A lot of politicians don't understand it. But once you take the oath, there is no limit on that oath. And the other thing most of them don't understand is that implicit in that oath is that you have working knowledge of the Constitution. Right? Because if you don't understand the Constitution, how in the world are you going to protect it? And it's not an on-the-job training kind of deal, right? The duty is as soon as you start, once you get that office. The Constitution was written for the average citizen or voter. And this is this is law that's been pronounced by the Supreme Court for over 200 years. The Constitution, in spite of what people want you to believe, some want you to think that you have to listen to a judge or a Supreme Court justice or an attorney or a law professor, and it's bunk. It's bunk. We've got 200 years of cases on this. It was written for the average person, okay? There are a few terms in the Constitution that are what we call term of arts. Most, most uh, of them are in Article 3, uh, which relates to the judiciary, like original jurisdiction and some of those. But those are easy to look up in the law dictionary. There are a few terms that some, the meanings may have changed over time. But that's not hard to figure out. You have dictionaries. I, I refer to a Johnson's Dictionary. I think it was a 1755 uh, or a Noah Webster Dictionary. It's 1823 that you can go to and find out what the actual meanings were back then. And, and some of the meanings don't change. For instance, the Second Amendment that says, you know, thou shalt not infringe, it means exactly what it says. Right. Exactly. Right. And again, I would note that the, the term militia had a very particular meaning there. And in the Constitution, it is what we would call term of art. And it was an understanding of the, of the uh, people of the states as of the time the Constitution was formed, what a, a militia was. And we had had hundreds of years of experience. The militia carried over from, from uh, uh, the feudal system in Europe, from Britain, from, from our standpoint, into the colonies up through the states, and then on into what we have now under the Constitution. People don't understand the meaning of militia now. The militia, just to be clear, is a state governmental entity. And it has two requirements that, that require the state to do it. One of them is the Constitution requires that they maintain it. But it is an organization, a part-time citizen army, that is under the strict control and supervision of the state. If you see individuals out running around calling themselves a militia, it's false. That is not a militia. That's whatever. It's a, it's, a, it's a paramilitary group, but it's not a militia. 
The restrictions under the oath of support means that one under the oath may not propose, they may not sponsor, they may not support, they may not vote for an unconstitutional proposal, nor may they enforce an unconstitutional enactment. In addition, they must actively resist any such proposal or enactment with all the power of their office and person. Different offices may have different resources at their disposal. So the president has an army, all right, that he can use. But it doesn't matter about that. Their responsibility is the same. The resources may be different. Their responsibility is the same. So, and again, one of, a person under oath to support the Constitution is, in essence, a federal officer. The county clerk down here is just as obligated to support that Constitution and resist unconstitutional laws as any federal legislator. Okay? It's not limited geographically. We run into this all the time. For instance, we have a national program uh, trying to pass legislation at the city, the county, the state, and the sheriff level against the citizen detention provisions of the, 19, uh, the uh, 2012 NADA. And what we run into constantly is we have these county legislators, even state legislators, so that's a federal matter. Uh, we don't have any power over that. When they say stuff like that, it means they don't understand how the federal system is set up, and they don't understand the scope of their oath. Their oath is to protect the Constitution from whatever attack is waged against it. And again, this is just another depiction of the various entities that are under this oath. Okay, so what are the state's duties to protect the citizens' rights? <coughs> Their officers, all the state officers, right? We just saw that Article 6, Section 2, or Section 3, are under an oath to support the Constitution. So they are not, not only not infringe, but to protect the rights. In addition to that, the states are under a duty of allegiance and protection. And has anybody ever heard of allegiance and protection? Okay, good. Most people don't understand it. Allegiance and protection is the ancient inherent principle of sovereignty that establishes the mutual obligations between a sovereign and its subject citizens. And remember, the states are sovereign entities. It's noted at least three times by the Apostle Paul in Acts 16, 22, and 23. It's noted three times in the Declaration of Independence, and it's recognized by the Supreme Court in a score of cases. And it's the allegiance that you refer to when you say I pledge allegiance to the flag. Very few of your, your public officials understand this, but they're taking this allegiance, this oath of allegiance, and they don't even know what, their, what the responsibilities are. They don't even know really what it is. Now the other problem that they get into with this, and one of the problems I say that we have is our politicians no longer fear of God and they don't fear the people. I've gone back and looked at the historical record, and if you go back to the time of the founding, what that oath meant was you were saying, God, if I violate my oath, seek retribution on me, punish me for that, right? And they took it seriously. You didn't ask God to punish you for not fulfilling your, your oath and then break it. And they do it all the time now. I will tell you that probably 90, 95% of them violated the, their oath when they walked in the door because they didn't even have working knowledge of the Constitution when they took the darn thing, right? So they're, they're violating it from the get-go. Okay, now this is how the system is set up, the federal system is set up. Uh, and you can think of the Constitution then as a scale. On one side of the scale, we have the central government. On the other side, we have the state governments. And the people serve as a balancing uh, apparatus to be involved. They're supposed to participate. This is what Alexander Ham Hamilton said in Federalist 28. It may be sa safely to be received as an axiom in our political system that the state governments will, in all possible contingencies, afford complete security against invasions of the public liberty by the national authority. So whose job is it to keep the central government under control? 
Again, he says, power being almost always the right of the power, the general government will at all times stand ready to check the usurpations of the state governments, and these will have the same disposition towards the general government. The people, by throwing themselves into either scale, will infallibly make it preponderant. If their rights are invaded by either, they can make the use of the other as the instruments of their redress. Who is responsible for keeping the governments under control? The people are, with the assistance of the other governments. So when you hear your state legislators say, well, that's a federal issue, they don't have any responsibility there, they have no idea what their job is. They don't know what the responsibility is under their oath. And I, you know, I would say to you, they don't have a, a very serious respect for, for uh, God because they've taken this oath and that they're, at the get-go, they're violating it. And this is the depiction of what Hamilton was talking about. If the central government becomes overpowering, the people pull their weight behind the states, the states working together then are to rebalance and bring it back into, uh, back into balance. And this relates to the to the militia, the well-regulated militia, which again relates to uh, laws and statutes that regulate and control and supervise the militia. If the representatives of the people betray their constituent, there is in no resource left but the exertion of that original right of self-defense, which is paramount to all positive forms of government. That's what we don't want to get to. The people are really the first and last line of defense of our own liberties. We are. In the first case, it's political to be participatory in the government. In the second, it's force of arms. We don't want it to get to the being force of arms, but that is our right. If circumstances should at any time obligate the government to form an army of any magnitude and they're talking about the, the central government. The army can never be formable to the liberties of the people, but there is a large body of citizens, little if any at all, inferior to them in discipline and the use of arms, who stand ready to defend their own rights and the rights of their fellow citizens. That's, that's it. That's the last line of defense right there. The militia of the people, the people of the state, as a, as a part-time military operating uh, under the strict control uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the state. Section 2. This is a Tennessee constitution. They recognize this. This, this came from the founders, right? This is, this is, they all had this concept before the constitution ever came into existence. That government being instituted for the, the common benefit, the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind. We're not here to serve the government. The government's here to serve us. Right. There's no other country in the world where that concept exists. It's treasonous to say that in other countries. It's treasonous not to recognize it in this country. Okay, do we have any questions on that? Just, does everybody understand? Okay, now I want to go through the actual Article 5 amendment, pardon me, the amendment process itself. Okay, the authority for modifying our government is recognized, it's inherent in the people, but recognized in the Declaration of Independence. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, and they're talking about the fundamental unalienable rights, God-given rights, uh, this, uh, it, is, it is the right of the people, it's a sovereign authority, to alter, and that's in Article 5, is to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. And they're talking about a constitutional convention there. There's no provision in the Constitution for a constitutional uh, convention. But it is the right of the people. Okay, now here's one of the key uh, misconceptions that the promoters of an Article 5 want to present. Uh, that they're saying, and again, the Constitutional Convention, or CONCON, as you have referred to, means that you're, you're gathering together to write a complete Constitution. An Article 5 Amendments Convention is a change to, existing, to an existing Constitution. 
and they're technically different, right? You can see that. One of them, you're going to write in the Constitution, the other, you're going to amend it. But here's the catch. And you always make that point. Oh, this is not a con con. It's only an amendment uh, convention. Article 5 sets no limit on the scope of an amendment. So, technically, it could be the change of one comma with the change of everything but one comma. So, the Constitutional Convention and an Article 5 Convention are a distinction without a difference. It's a diversionary tactic that they use to mislead people. And I hear this from legislators, state legislators, well, it's just an amendments convention, just an amendments convention, and they don't even have any understanding of what they're talking about. Constitution? That's not what we're really afraid of, is it? Right? What we're afraid of is that they are going to fundamentally change the structure of our government. And more importantly, they'll change the status of our sovereignty. That's what we're concerned about. And it doesn't take much. Five words can change everything. Five little words can do it. The state sovereignty is abolished. That doesn't. It kills federalism. And remember, part of the state's responsibility comes from their sovereignty, right? Their allegiance and protection, their duty of allegiance and protection. We owe the sovereign allegiance, our loyalty, serve in the army, pay taxes, follow the, the, the reasonable and moral laws, uh, and serve in the militia and the posse comitatus. Uh, Posse comitatus when required to. Uh, and in exchange for that, we are supposed to have protection of our rights. But if you change that, if they're no longer sovereign, then they don't have any authority to keep the central government in check. And they certainly don't have the ability to keep the central government from uh, in, in, uh, infringing upon your unalienable God given rights. I want to go through the actual text, uh, and this is this is the text itself. Let's see what some of the founders said about this. And this is a reference again to Article Five. It guards equally against the extreme facility of that which would render the Constitution too novel and extreme and difficult, which might perpetuate its, uh, its discovered faults. It moreover is equally enables the government, the general and the state governments, to originate an amendment of errors. If there's a problem, Article 5 is to cure that problem. Like, uh, uh, for instance, the 11th Amendment. Uh, the, the phraseology that they used uh, in the Constitution wasn't adequate for what they meant. To, to, in essence, to keep the states from being sued by citizens was one of the issues. And so they changed, they did an amendment on them to shore that up, to make it clear. Constitution says what it means and means what it says. And this is Jefferson's advice. Instead of trying to, to, to squeeze some type of meaning out of it, you need to go to the text, put it in the context of, of the time in which it was passed and the intent in which it was passed. Don't, don't make things up as you go along. You know, our court system now is pretty good about doing that. It's not a living document, it's a legal document. <coughs> Okay, this is a diagram of the actual process under Article 5. And you really have a two-phase process. In the top, you have an amendment phase, right, where amendments are proposed. And in the bottom, you have a ratification phase. There are two means to initiate uh, proposals, and there are two means to ratify. So in essence, you have four different procedures that can be used. Okay, now let's follow this along. 
It says the Congress, whenever two thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments. Okay, right there it is, right? That's the diagram. I'm not storing to you. And then it says, Congress, on the application of the legislatures of two thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Right there, there's the process. Now, this is where another little deception sneaks in. You'll notice that it says Congress calls. What they will say over and over, and I'm talking about the alley people, the Convention of States people, what they say over and over and over is that the states call the convention. The states do not call the convention. They apply. Congress has to call. And call is a term of art. It has a very particular meaning. And the person that calls that convention, and most of you are probably aware of this by, by conventions that you've attended, if you call a, the entity that calls an ad hoc convention, which is what this would be, is, has the authority of doing the initial rules and delegate selection of that convention. In fact, I talked to one of our legislators in Kansas, who's a, a, a not only a legislature, but a retired federal judge and an attorney. And he told me, he said, well, Richard, you know, the, the uh, states call the convention. I said, no, sir, they do not. It's the Congress. No, they don't. So I pulled out my Constitution, or sell, sell them the fabric, and I read it to him. But he says, let me see that, because he had to read it for himself, right? He's a little bit embarrassed now. He said, well, uh, uh, yeah, but that's just ministerial. No, it's not ministerial. It's a term of art. It means something. It meant something when they wrote it. It still means the same thing today. Okay, and this is talking about the ratification procedure. And Congress is the one that gets to select that procedure. Is it going to be by the, the, the legislatures in the states or convention, or sorry, excuse me, legislatures of the states, right? Or convention in the states. It doesn't say convention of the states. You get that little subtle drift? That, that could be pretty significant. Okay, and so there it is. Here's my diagram. That's what it's talking about right there. Now, what really controls the, the Congress's power? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 grants Congress the power to make all laws necessary and proper to fulfill their Article 5 duties, right? And it says the Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, right, the Article 1, Section 8 powers, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government. And what did we see? What is one of those duties? It can propose amendments to the Constitution. It has to call upon application. And it's the one that can do the, 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 the directs how it's to be ratified. And then the bottom line authority is to make all laws necessary and proper. This is another deception that they make. Because they'll say, these promoters will say, there's nothing in Article 5 that says Congress has the power to do anything beyond the call. That's true, right? Yes. But Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 says what? They have the power to make all reasonable and necessary laws to facilitate that duty. And this is what the states have the, the authority to do under Article 5, to make the application to Congress to, to do the convention for proposing amendments and to hold the ratification procedure as directed by Congress. And their responsibility, their duty under Article 5 is not a state duty. It's a federal duty. It comes from the Constitution. It's not an inherent responsibility or duty of the states. It doesn't come from the state Constitution, right? So if Congress says you have to have a convention to ratify it, they can't do it by the legislature. They don't have the authority, right? The Constitution is supreme. All right, so then the big issue that the promoters want to talk about is who's controlling the, the uh, Article 5? And that's why they come up with this term, uh, the Convention of States. It's a brand new. Uh, strategy. It's a marketing strategy to make you think uh, that the states have more control of it than they do. That's what it is. A convention of states is simply a convention called by one or more states under state authority to meet with 
one or more other states, an interstate convention, it's a convention of states. A, a Article 5 convention is not a convention of states. It's a national convention called by Congress at which the states may send representatives. Okay, so this is the diagram. And one of the arguments they want to make, they say, well, you know what, Congress, the central government controls the first procedure because they can do, they can propose amendments Congress can. So therefore, regardless of what the Constitution says, therefore the states must control the second one, right? Well, the problem with that is Article 5 doesn't say that, number one. And number two, if you look at this, what do you see? Who controls any of those processes? It's a federal process. The component parts of the federal government, Congress, and the states, and or the people are involved in both procedures. One entity doesn't control it at all. It's a federal process. And this is just another depiction of that, uh, of that process. Again, it's just a, it's a federal convention. It's not a state convention. It's not a convention of states. Do you have any questions over that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You keep mentioning proponents of, or proponents of this of this convention. Are you talking about all proponents and advocates of this? Are you talking about uh, other than conservatives? Because when I think of proponents, I think of Mark Levin. I don't have his credibility or, or, or integrity as a conservative at all. Uh, well, I'm going to get into that. We're going to talk about that. But, uh, I, know, I know folks on the left are proponents too. You know? Oh, yeah. Listen. You know, someone said earlier that the, the Democrats and Republicans were different uh, legs of the same pair of pants. Listen, the people that control those parties are the same way. You have billionaires on the conservative side, that are so-called conservatives, that are promoting this and spending millions and millions of dollars. And you have the liberals and the progressives that are likewise wanting to do it. Right? They're working together. Okay, now we're going to go into the history of it. This is an article that I put together that, that lays out the, uh, the details of how this got going. It started in 1963 when the Ford Foundation funded the, the uh, Fund for the Republic. They gave them $16.5 million. They set up, the, the Fund for the Republic set up the Center for the Study of, of uh, Democratic Institutions. They gave them $25 million. So that's $41.5 million. In today's terms, I went back and, and adjusted it for today's terms. They spent half a billion to $1.2 billion to see that this was done. Do you think they were serious about this? And the mandate was to write a new constitution. That's what the mandate was. Is anybody aware of Rex Tutwell? Have you heard the name? You guys should all be familiar with this guy, frankly. He's a very important person in our history. He was hired to head up this project that the Ford, now Ford Foundation was funding. He was a professor, a liberal professor from Columbia University. He headed FDR's New Deal Brain Trust. He was an internationalist, what we would call a globalist today, a member of the committee to, to frame a world constitution. Somebody said something earlier today about the one world, the new world order and all that. But that's what we're talking about here. Uh, hired one, he hired, went out and hired 100 academics and professors to help him do this. And then the final project that was released in 1973 was called the New States Constitution. And one of the things that it did, and it did a lot of things, one of the things it did was, is it abolished the states and set up federal regions in their place. Between 73 and 76, Nelson Rockefeller, who was the Senate president, uh, was pushing them for the convention. He started pushing for this. And the banner was the balanced budget. The balanced budget has always been the bait. Always been the bait for this from the very beginning. And he was a friend of Tugwell's and he was out promoting the Tugwell Constitution. And I also know that the American Legislative Exchange Council a conservative group, quote unquote, was also started in 73. That's kind of interesting. 
In the mid-80s, they started to push a limited convention under a balanced budget again. Now, the reason that they did this was that when they tried it in the 70s, people were concerned, said, oh, no, we're not, we don't want that. The whole, the whole Constitution's open for amendment. That's not good. That's dangerous. We kind of like the Constitution. And so then they, the promoters of this, right, the people that the poor foundation, the people that they hard, come back and say, oh, we're going to do a limited convention. It was never thought that anybody could do a limited convention before that. They made it out of whole cloth. It just, you know, just all of a sudden materialized. And that's what they keep saying today. Oh, it can be limited. It can be limited. This is a, a, a during this period of time, we had Phyllis Shafley and, and Chief Justice Warren Burger that were corresponding on this. And one of the issues that they corresponded on was whether or not it could be limited. He said, no, there's no way to limit it. Uh, but he says, in one of his letters to Shafley was, he was approached by the professors. Now, who do you think the professors were? It was part of the academics that, that Tug O'Hara, right? That's who it is. Uh, uh, approached him, and one of the things they were trying to do was, was to promote this, this new constitution. And what it did was it abolished the states, right? Instead of federal regions. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Tugwell. Constitution, right? It was bought, paid for by the Ford Foundation. At this point, the Rockefeller Foundation started was acting in the, in the promotion as well. Um, and then in the 90s, they began pushing for, it was actually not a convention of states, but a conference of states, a conference. And so you start seeing the seeds of the new, of the new strategy that they're using. And again, balanced budget, right? Does anybody understand what the problem is with the balanced budget, why you can't really do that? Does anybody understand that? Most, most of the states have balanced budgets, right? Kansas does. And Kansas is in debt off balance, off, off balance sheet. They're in debt about, uh, I think it's $22, $23 billion, right? But they have a balanced budget, right? And the, the main problem is that there's always exceptions, right? What about if we're at war? What if there's an emergency? What are you going to do? Because well, there's always an escape clause, right? The Congress did a research, an investigation, I think it was called something like the status of the state of emergency of the union. They did it in, uh, I want to say, 73 or 79. And what they found out was that the United States of America had been in a state of emergency from 1933 until 1973, right? Now, I know that we've been in a state of emergency from September the 11th, 2001 until today. And I'm sure there was a period of time in between when we had these emergencies. So what good is the balanced budget going to do for you, right? We're always in a state of emergency. We're down to war on terrorism. It's going to last forever. Terrorism is a technique. It's not war against the, the Germans or, the, or Japan. It's a war against the technique. It's like saying we're going to have a war against marching or singing. It'll last forever. And we're under a state of emergency now because of that. It's a farce. And what's more, if they follow the Constitution, we would have balanced budget problems, right? The, the, the Constitution doesn't provide for uh, environmental regulations. It doesn't provide for education. It doesn't provide for uh, housing and transportation. Those are all unconstitutional things the federal government does on its own. And the states go along with it because they get bribed, right? I heard a legislator the other day say, well, you know what we need to do is we need to cut the ties from the federal government to keep their money. Does that happen? Is that ever going to happen? No. Nonsense. Okay, in, in 2010, 2014, they start promoting it as the Convention of States. And that's not completely correct because in 2011, they had a meeting with the Tea Party Patriots, right? A conservative group, right? Quote, unquote. Uh, and Harvard Law with a Professor Lessig, who's a liberal professor, right? And they called it the Conference of the Constitutional Convention. See, at that point in time, the marketing department hadn't issued the memo that we're going to call the Convention of States from now on, right? So they're still calling it a con con. But now it's a Convention of States. Again, the balanced budget, but they have an amendment for everything. Look at Levine's book. We've gone out and consolidated all the proposed amendments. And there's like 80 some proposed amendments. 80 proposed amendments so far. Something for everybody. They say it can be a limited subject, it can be a limited topic, it can be limited to a specific amendment. Most uh, experts in the area would say you can't limit it to a specific amendment. 
And I would agree with that. Look at the Constitution. What does it say? The states aren't even required to request uh, a, 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 a specific topic for an application. All they have to do is say, we want a Article 5 convention. That's all they have to say. Now, the other thing that they started doing this time around is they're trying to do an end run around the Article 5, and they're doing it with an Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, Interstate Compact. This is that paper I was telling you about. And basically, what the, what the Article 5 does, and the Supreme Court has said this, it designates certain bodies, certain uh, deliberative bodies to, uh, to propose amendments, right? And those bodies are what? Congress and the Convention. But guess what? If you do an uh, interstate compact, you can do it all in advance. And in the case of Kansas, the delegates won't even be there because the real delegates, under a law that we just passed, will be our governor and the Speaker of the House and the Senate President, right? Wow, how convenient. It won't be a delivery body. It's unconstitutional, but they say, we can do that because we can ensure the outcome that way. Nonsense. Okay, any questions on that? What's in it for? Well, I suppose part of it would be uh, money, getting control and access. Why did, why did they uh, eliminate the militia of the states? The people that were behind that was Teddy Roosevelt and, a, and, a, and the Secretary of War, whose name was Root, an Ira Root or something like that. He was a personal friend and attorney and the head of the Carnegie Endowment Foundation. They're the ones that got rid of the militia and they established in its place what is called the National Guard. The National Guard, and it's been recognized by the Senate, is a standing army of the federal government. It's not a militia. The Constitution says the states are going to maintain their militia, the state militia, and the federal government is going to sponsor it, right? What's going on now? We are subsidizing the federal army, right? And where's our protection? We don't have any protection. The whole point of the militia was a counterbalance to the federal army. We don't have that. Why did they do it? Well, one thing was that there was talk of war at that time. There were problems in Europe. And so now we can send troops over there. We have to buy more bullets, more arms. We have uh, trains that have to, to haul things around with tremendous use of steel and resources. People make lots of money on it. It's, tr it's control of money. That's why they do this. I say no, but they, they'll tell you that they can. And I, it's, I, I say absolutely they can, because it eliminates the delivery body aspect of Article 5. But let me tell you, you, and, you know, probably Mark Levine is going along with that, too. It's amazing. <coughs> by statute alone. The National Guard takes a dual oath. They take an oath to the federal government. And that's, and we've had problems. I, I, I could get into the history of this, it's kind of interesting. But, um, you know, the national, the, the militia cannot be used as an offensive force. It can't be sent overseas. It has to stay in the U.S., right? What, what happens to our National Guard now? They fought most of Vietnam, right? Why did they do that? Well, it's unconstitutional. Some government actually sued over that. The courts said, oh, no, no, this is a standing warning stop, right? It's better. I said that to a guy in, in South Dakota. He had retired from the National Guard and wanted to punch me. All right? He got offended. He said, no, we're the militia. Really? Did you, did you go to the Middle East? Sure. Uh, <laughs> Constitution. <laughs> well, you're not reading that correctly. I mean, look, the average voter the average person. Read it. Read it yourself. But what is that like? What's that? The militia of the National Guard is that like? Does it have to bring them under the jurisdiction of the Department of Defense? They're heavily subsidized by the Department of Defense. Well, as a militia, they remain under the control of the state, right? But they can be federalized when they were the militia. 
but they're they're always under oath to the federal government. They serve a dual purpose now. They are a dual uh, entity, and any control that the states have over them is, like I said, illusory. They can pass another law and do away with it, and they've done it. They've done it in the past. Okay, let's talk about the current promoters. <clears throat> Who's behind it? Big money and special interest. The Koch brothers, George Soros, Leon Limbach III, and non-governmental organizations. See, that's another consistency that we see. From the very beginning, they've used NGOs, non-governmental organizations, to do their bidding, right? And we've seen the same thing happen with the Federal Reserve. We see the same thing with sustainable development. They use NGOs to accomplish their objectives. And sustainable development is largely promoted by who? The Rockefellers, the Ford Foundation. Those are the people who are doing it. The same ones that did this stuff. Media figures, Trish Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, Mark Levine, on and on. They're all promoting this stuff. So that's the change this time in this campaign. And here they are. Now here's the reason. Sean Hannity, since 2008, had been paid $1.3 million a year through the Heritage Foundation. Heritage Foundation is funded by the Cokes. Rush Limbaugh, since 2009, has been getting $2 million. And now I'm not talking about directly. They, they don't deliver to their house. The producers or their advertisers get this money, right, to support their programs. Uh, you know, again, through the Heritage Foundation. Mark Levine, since 2010, a million plus through Americans for Prosperity. It's a co organization, Americans for Prosperity. Glenn Beck, since 2010, over a million a year from Freedom Works. Co associated organization. Freedom Works, by the way, also funds the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. Right? Is that consistent? What does U.S. Chamber of Commerce support? Open borders, amnesty, common core, on and up sustainable development. You'll see they pay both sides of the table, right? You can't win with these guys. Heads I win, tails you lose. The, the organizations that I'm talking about, NGOs, most of them are members of the State Policy Network, which is funded by Charles Koch Foundation and Castle Rock Foundation. Castle Rock is Adolf Kerr's family. That's who does that. Heritage Foundation, Freedom Works, Cato Institute, Independence Institute, that's where I think Robert Nielsen, uh, one of the big gurus of this, is promoting this works, the Goldwater Institute. Most are connected directly or indirectly with the Koch brothers. Heritage uh, support Sean Handy, we just we covered this, and, and uh, Rush Limbaugh, funded by Charles Koch, Castle Rock, and Adolf Kerr's Foundation. Big money. They started it, and they're still involved in it. And what are, what's their message here? The message here is, you guys don't have to worry about this, right? We've got a problem. It's not your fault. You know whose fault it is? It's the lying, cheating politicians, those dirty dogs. And you know what? Don't worry about it. Go home and watch your TV because we're having a convention. And we'll take care of everything for you. Who's responsible for this? Who's responsible for it? Is it, is it really the, the politicians' fault? It's our fault. Where do these politicians come from? They come from us, right? Who keeps putting them back in the, in, in the office? We do. Who's not holding them accountable? accountable? We're not, right? Don't worry about it. Relax. We're going to take care of it. This is one of the most superficial books you'll ever get on this issue. It does nothing. It covers nothing. I, I was in a... In a a meeting with the guy, and he stood up and says, I read the Levine book. It answers all these concerns. It answers no concerns. If you know anything at all about this, this is the most superficial book you could ever go to. But they all want to wait a day. What about a book? And they're talking about the limited, right? It's always going to be limited. This is what the Convention of States, uh, their communications director said. I think the majority of Americans are too lazy to elect honest politicians. That's true, right? I think that's true. But I think that some men and women can be found who are morally and intellectually capable of rewriting the Constitution. And see, well, they said, oh, we're just going to do these little amendments, right? 
There he's saying, we're going to rewrite the Constitution. The supplement's what you need. It's not a change of personnel. You need a change of structure. Can, can we listen to that one more time? This is Mike Ferris. He's one of the biggest promoters of this nonsense. The supplement's what you need. It's not a change of personnel. You need a change of structure. We're not going to get rid of those lying, corrupt, no good for nothing, cheating politicians. We're going to change the Constitution. Right? Structure. The structure of the Constitution. The Seventh Amendment changed the structure, right? Because the states selected the senators that went to the central government, right? Control. They had control in there. And the 17th Amendment took it away, right? And that's another argument they made. Oh, don't worry about it, man. Come on. Number one is if there's a problem, Congress will take care of it. Well, why are you doing this? Well, because Congress is not doing what they're supposed to do. Okay? If that's a problem, the, the judiciary take care of it. Why do you want to do this? Well, because the judiciary is not doing what it's supposed to do. And so finally they say, and the state, so it's a final safeguard. They'll never do anything against their interests. They'll never do anything wacky. Right? The 17th Amendment, income tax prohibition. I had a debate with the Kansas director of this convention of the states, and he, you know, he's doing this, oh, the 38 states, and I reminded him of these, of these uh, amendments. He goes, well, that's right, but what Mr. Price not telling you is they had a big progressive movement back then. And I said to him, what in the hell do you call Obamacare? And <laughs> <laughs> I guess I didn't say that. <laughs> now, this is what the Convention of States application, model application says. They're going to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government. They're going to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. And they're going to limit the terms of office for its officials and for members of Congress. Right? Now, this is another means of deception. Because they give you three options as if there's going to be a limitation. They're only going to deal with three things. Impose fiscal restraints on the federal government. That's Article 1. Right? Article 1. They're going to limit the terms of office for its officials and members of Congress. That's Article 1, Congress, Article 2, the President, and Article 3, the Judiciary, right? But the middle one says what? We're going to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. What is the purpose of the Constitution? To set the limits on the federal government. Now, the old ministers won't relate to Article 7. Does anybody know why it doesn't relate to Article 7? That's, that's the article that was used to initially ratify the current Constitution. So it's moot. But everything else is up vote for grads. It's deception. Now this is, this is Rob Madison again. He's one of these main proponents. He's a great judicial scholar, attorney, and a law professor. Uh, I think well, Barack Obama is a law professor, right? Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Rob Mousen, so we should trust this guy. Rob Mousen, author of the Alec, uh, Article 5 Handbook, right there, a big promoter. Remember Alec started in 73? Uh, the Convention of States Article 5 Compendium and prime source for Mark Levine's uh, delivery of amendment books. And here's what he's telling legislators. Uh, interstate, con interstate conventions always have determined issues according to a one state, one vote, although a convention is free to change the rule. Initial suffrage is one state, one vote, but they're free to change the rule, right? This is, this is what he's saying. And again, this is not an interstate uh, convention. It's not a convention of states. It's a national convention. But now, what he says when he's trying to, to slam uh, Shapley uh, with her stuff, he's saying, he's saying, uh, uh, a convention for proposing amendments is a meeting of sovereignties or semi sovereignty Each state has one vote. And he wrote this in an article refuting what uh, Phyllis Shapley was saying, right? And I think he made some comment about what she's getting old or something like that. I mean, he had a little slander there. Uh, I, I've met her recently, and she is uh, getting older. But listen, she's still sharp. She knows what's going on.
Now this is a debate that we had with their staff in this one. This is the second time we debated. Now one thing uh, that Mr. Lewis pointed out is our application is fairly broad. It specifies three topics that the convention can consider. It can consider fiscal restraints on the federal government. It can consider items which limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. And it can consider term limits for federal officials. So that would be Congress, that would be members of the Supreme Court. And Mr. Lewis's argument against this is that it opens up all the articles. And that's true. It, well, that's not true. all the articles, as you pointed out, seven. Article 7 is kind of out of the picture here. Article 6 is not going to really be touching that. But it does open up Article 1, dealing with Congress. Because guess what? Congress is part of the problem. It opens up Article 2. Why? Because the President is part of the problem. It opens up Article 3. Why? Because the Supreme Court is part of the problem. It allows us Article 5 to be considered so that the states don't have to go through this convoluted process in the future. So that if three quarters of the states agree in advance, they can propose amendments to the Constitution. It opens up these articles because the problem is not in an isolated single branch of the federal government. It's the president, it's the Supreme Court, and it's Congress. And if we limited ourselves to just touching one of those, we're not going to fix the problem. We're just going to shift the problem from Congress to now the president's just going to pass more executive orders doing whatever he wants. We're going to have more lawlessness. No, we need to address the problem as a whole. That's why our application is worded the way it is. That's why it's so broad. But I'll point out, it does have meaningful limits. Mr. Lewis said it doesn't have meaningful limits. It does. It's limited to limiting the government. And yes, I used the word limit there twice. It's limited to limiting the government. Did everybody understand that? Did yeah. you understand that? Does anybody know what limit means? <laughs> limit means set a boundary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We can limit the federal government and expand it if we want. And they are. We'll get to that in a second. Here's, here's uh, uh, Ferris. This is one of the things Ferris is saying. If I am a delegate to the convention, I will propose reconfiguring the Supreme Court after the model of the European Court of Human Rights. Well, let's go to that European model. It's working so good for those guys, right? So we're going to change that. And then they're going to have a limited term, right? And can be reapportioned or reappointed. Do you think that gives a judge any incentives to maybe make some rulings? You know, like Congress does now, man. You know, they're in there for a while, they make pass some laws, and next thing you know, they get million dollar jobs. Anybody remember Big Army? When he left Congress, what did he do? He went to work for one of these Koch brother organizations. One of the first things they did is give him a consulting contract for eight million dollars. But times that won't happen to the judges. Not gonna happen. You got cynical, you gotta believe, have faith. Now this is interesting. This is this is Mike Ferris himself. He wants to give the government a new power, and that is control over your kids, right? The parental rights amendment. There's already one up there in Congress that he's pushing. And if he gets a chance, he'll push it through through this. Right now, the federal government has absolutely no authority whatsoever over domestic relations. None. It's totally a state issue. If he passes this, the federal government then has the power, right? And who's going to interpret the power and the scope of the power? The federal government will. Does anybody know what not infringe means? Yeah. It means that you can make people buy license for firearms. You can tell them not firearms they can't have, right? That's what not infringe means, right? Yeah. Since 1926, the federal government has been regulating firearms when they have absolutely no right whatsoever to do. Now what happens if you give them a right? How far do you think they're going to take it? And this is some of their propaganda, why it's so safe. Because they're going to be able to be limited, right? They're going to be able to control it. That's what they're saying. And what we see here, it's a lie. It's all a big lie. They're not going to limit anything. They themselves, and there are some states, I think including Kansas, there are some states that have passed their application, right? That's the entire Constitution. They're going to limit it to the entire Constitution. Wow. Well, what do you think? They have spent, at that time, up to 73, they spent as much as $1.2 billion. And they spent millions since through all these other little organizations. Do you think they're going to give up on that? Well, you know what I mean? Are they redoing the same old 
No, they didn't. They didn't. They were not able because they didn't follow convention. They were not able to to incorporate the aspects of that proposed constitution. So is this the same thing that they were made? Well, what do you think? No, it sounds like they're recreating Now, here's the other problem that you get into is that your legislators, you know, they don't know about this stuff. They haven't researched it. They're, they go to alley meetings. Now that people stick this stuff in front of them and say it's a wonderful thing, it's limited, we can do all these great things. The whole purpose is to limit the federal government, to control the federal government, part of five. It's nonsense. But that's what they get. They don't know this stuff, and they don't want to know this stuff. Now, having, do you think that a person can decide whether this is a good idea if you don't know this history? Do you have enough information? Are you adequately prepared to do a reasonable judgment on whether or not this is a good idea unless you know this? And they don't know it. I wouldn't trust them. And in fact, they are, they are doing the, the, the uh, Tugwell Constitution. It's called Sustainable Development. They're developing regional governance councils all over the country. So they're going to do it even if they don't do the Constitution. If we don't stop them, they're going to do it anyway. They're doing it now. Have you read this new state's Constitution? Yeah. I just pulled it up on my phone. It's a large file. Oh, what is a large file? Oh, this, this, is, this is a small part of it. Remember, if they do away with the sovereignty of the, Constitu or the states, Everything collapses. But basically what it does, it makes all of your God-given unalienable rights contingent upon an emergency situation. Anything can be suspended based on it. Because unalienable means kind of unalienable. Whatever now and if the government decides they can do away with it. It's kind of like not in French. It means, well, we can regulate it uh, quite a bit. Okay, this is a... Uh, can, can, can you hit the audio on this? Once in a while, these guys are honest. Right? You catch them in the right moment, they'll be honest with you. We debated this gentleman as well. It's funny though, we debate them, then they start changing their uh, talking points and adjust their side symptoms. Is it is it not going to come up? Okay. Let me let me ask you a question on Michael Ferris. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, I, I homeschool my kids and we use his organization to protect us. And I have a lot of respect for him. He's actually adamantly opposed to Common Core. You think it's something to where have you ever been in a debate with him? Is, is he you talk to him about these things and potentially change he, he his mind? No, we tried him over. He's supposed to be he's supposed to be here. Right, I know. Well he he, he runs. Uh, I have met him in person and, and talked to him about it. One of the things you know, I talked to him, I said, look, you know, I just testified against uh, the Kansas, they did a delegate se selection uh, legislation. And what it does is do an again run around the Constitution because like I said, it makes the governor and, and the, the key political people in Kansas that are doing it just so it's Republican are really the delegates. And when I told him that, he said, well, they won't get away with it. I'll nullify it. I'll nullify it. Uh, someone said something about George Soros and the progressives. And what's he saying? Well, they can go out and get their own convention. This is mine. This guy is the most perfect person I've ever met. You might have any questions while we're waiting for a second. It's already started. No, I'm serious. It's already, we're, we're in a state of war. Is that why there's no war? <laughs> what do you think? My congressman, Kim Lewis, camp, asked the Homeland Security, sent him a letter. Why are you doing this? They don't have like 1.2 or 4 billion bullets, and they're tactical. They're not training them, they're tactical. And they won't tell him. He's a congressman. His job is oversight. They won't tell him. Who's talking to you? The arrogance. The arrogance. Tennessee also did this delegate legislation this they, year. They did not. Delegate legislation for. Of the states. Yeah, no, it's probably the same thing. And they're setting it up to do an interim around the Constitution because they're making it a non deliberative body. So the governor and the, the uh, president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House uh, in Kansas, both of whom have been executive directors of ballot for some time, funded by the Co brothers, uh, uh, would be those people. And they're the ones that are behind the scenes promoting this. 
right? And they have the ability to select the delegates that will go, the quote, delegates. But the delegates, before they can vote on something, have to contact the governor of these guys to ask them what they can do. They can't do anything unless they come back. Who, who's really in charge, right? And how's that going to work for you? Have you ever, have you ever been at a convention where somebody makes a motion and they're ready to vote? And you say, oh, wait a minute, you're on your 48 hours. I've got to go vote to go. All right? Well, the, the key to the whole thing is you've got, you've got the, the way it's, the, 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 it operates is the, the, the uh, Congress is going to be petitioned by the states to, to hold a convention, and then Congress is going to set the rules of the convention, and then Congress is going to limit their own powers? You're right. How's that going to work? Well, but you've got to understand how a convention works. Once you get, once they get that convention, they can change all those rules. So you can't expect the, the, the federal government to limit itself. Well, that's our job, and that's the job well, of the I mean, states. They're trying to set it up with this convention to, to so that it's well, I think they have an alternative motive. The, the, the abolishment of the government, the, the, the constitutional convention, is not in the Constitution, right? It's an inherent power of the people. So what some people suspect is with these uh, interstate compacts, if they're going to get together, or, or one of these nonsensical things, and then somebody will stand up and say, hey, we're going to be a constitutional convention now. And they're power of the people. That's, that's what happened the first time around, right? This is a demonstration of June 10, which is applied. Should the states request a constitutional convention, Article 5 of the Constitution grants the states the rights to call for a convention for the purpose of amending the Constitution. A constitutional convention called to repair the gaping holes torn in the fabric of our founding document by our politicians' ravenous appetite for power, unrestrained by any defining moral compass, may be the only way to rein in the federal government, restore fiscal sanity, and preserve a democratic republic. Some, and not without justification, fear this approach is too radical and too fraught with risk. This is a demonstration the concerns of rational. If we embark on this journey, we cannot be certain of the outcome. But timid men have never changed the course of history. And one thing I am certain, our current course is the road to bondage, dependency, and bankruptcy. Its destination is the end of liberty. Thomas Paine said of our struggle for independence from England, tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. To download a copy of your transcript, go to inspireandignite.com. Well, let me tell you, they play off, they play on these legislators' egos and their arrogance. Uh, you know, I walked into one of them's office and he was powdering a bit, right? That's a joke. But they tell him that. Well, you're going to be making history, right? You're like the founders, right? Do we have anybody out there? We don't in Kansas that's equivalent to, 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 to Jefferson or any of them. And yet they, you know, in their arrogance, think they're going to renew this Constitution. Okay, February the 20th, 2014, Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, a strong Republican supporter of, of efforts to trigger an Article 5 stated. The interesting thing is, I think we have a clip of this. Yeah, let's go ahead and just go to the clip, the next slide. I love this. Now, this is a, a conservative darling in Kansas, right? Another law professor, another Harvard trained guy. The, the interesting thing is, only conservatives are paying attention. If you ask a liberal, they'll say, what was the convention? They'll say, what's our power? And because we're the only ones who care about the Constitution. Now, this is a GOP group in Kansas that he's talking to. This is the second month. The, first, the month before this, they had the Kansas director of the COS, the Convention of State, come in and promote this nonsense to Republicans. That's who he's talking to, Republicans, right? We asked and asked and asked and asked to come in and do a response to this, and we still haven't been able to do it, right? One side. The GOP's trying to control it, one side. Now, before this, I have him on tape where someone asking at a, at a Tea Party rally back in 2010, if this was a good idea, no, it's dangerous. You want to do it? It's dangerous. What happened to him? He also was supported by the lady the, at the, the GOP uh, National Convention. He is one of them that killed an anti National Defense Authorization Act resolution. He helped kill it, right? It violates half the Bill of Rights. It, it, it applies the, the law of war to U.S. citizens, right? It's serious, it's very serious. The only thing more serious than that is this con con thing. Because listen, they get this con con nonsense, common core, sustainable development, all of it, they cram down their throat. Mm -hmm. 
This is, I talked about this earlier, the Conference on the Constitutional Convention hosted by liberal Harvard Law professor and the Tea Party Patriots, co-funded. And it was a who who of progressive uh, and conservatives that were doing this. I mean, look at some of these names. You can recognize some of them are associated with Soros. Young Turks, right? Cato was involved, right? Little Water. Do you think these guys all have your best interests in mind? Now, see that the, the progressives aren't paying attention to this, right? Now, I'm going to go through a list of progressives. This is an, a, an organization uh, moved to amend. It's a progressive uh, hub organization. These are all the organizations that are a member of this organization promoting a constitutional convention. Did Mr. Kobach tell the truth, the GOP there in Kansas? 400. And this isn't the only progressive organization supporting this stuff. Right? 400 of them. But they're not paying attention. So it says conservatives want a piece of this constitution, right? Okay. I'm sorry. I, I was adding back to mine and not yours. Here's the list of the progressives in this one uh, hub organization. Was, was he being honest? Maybe he just didn't know about all these guys, I guess. Okay. And this is just covering some of the deceptions. You know, Art of Flight Convention is a convention state. It's nonsense. Art of Flight Convention can be limited to a single issue. Well, it can. Uh, and even if it could, that's not what they want to do. They've said they don't want to do it. That's not what they want to do. And they've admitted that their application opens a wide up, right? People are so dumb, right? They'll believe anything. Parental rights amendment expands federal power. Article 5 convention control is controlled by the states. States don't control it. Article 5 convention uh, controlled by Congress. That's nonsense. You just saw it yourself. It's a federal process. Components of the federal government are involved. Congress and the states and sometimes the people. Article 1, Section 10 is an alternative method to Article 5. Nonsense. It's unconstitutional. And Cobox in Kansas say, now we can do an Article 5. And we can do an Article 5 with the Interstate Compact. And we can do a health care compact. And we're getting them all. Right? No one's going to challenge Chris Kobach. He's a conservative, man. He's a conservative. And here it is. That's what it's all about. They're dangling the carrots. Caridocracy. Caridocracy. They've been bribing the states. The Fed's been bribing the states for almost 100 years. And now they're playing the same game. They're doing the same stuff. We're changing the Constitution to make public servants follow the Constitution. That's the only thing you have to ask. See, the whole point behind bringing in Hannity and, and Rush Limbaugh and Levine, it's like the liberals do. They, they do the Hollywood walk. The glitch boys come out because they don't want you to, to think of things rationally and objectively. They're going to make, they want you to decide on a, on a a subjective emotional basis. That's why they, they haul out these uh, glitz boys from Hollywood. That's what they're doing. They, these are the glitz boys. Rush Limbaugh is one of the glitz boys on our side, right? Okay, now listen to this. This is good. My debate, this is the Kansas director of the Convention of States, and I had uh, debated him about a week prior to this. And this is the month before Kobach spoke to the same group. Now listen to what he says. What does he teach the president who has been ignoring our present constitution? Yes. 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 Now, Senator Roberts addressed me when the president talked about saying, We've got a lot of proud presidents out there right now. It's pretty to use the end of the telephone to subvert Congress. So what's going to stop them from you know, ignoring new, new amendments? Uh, um, it, it's, it's a problem that we're going to face no matter if we go down our road or not. Uh, we, we need to deal with that. We definitely do. It's the rule of law, and he's subject to the rule of law just like anybody else. We need to hold him accountable. Uh, the state isn't going to hold them accountable. That's the people need to definitely do that. Okay. Uh, so everybody catch what he said? The question was, the president 
is not obeying the Constitution. So if we change the Constitution, what, mean, what, what makes you think he's going to follow the new one? And he said, well, that's just something we'll have to do. All right? We're going to deal with it anyway. So why do you want to do this? Right? Why do you want to do this? Shouldn't we get, make, hold them accountable first? Right? If you hold them accountable, you don't have to make any changes, right? And if you don't hold them accountable, it doesn't matter what changes you make. The real problem with the Republic is that we, the people, are not holding our public servants, general or state, accountable. Until we hold them accountable, no change to the constitutional matter. And once we hold them accountable, no change to the Constitution will be necessary. Right. This is the testimony I gave in front of the Kansas Senate, right? <clears throat> you know, the other thing I asked these guys, I said, you know, people don't obey the Ten Commandments. Do you guys think that we should rewrite the Ten Commandments? Yeah. Right? So later they called me back. You know, I, I did my little thing. One of the senators calls me back, asked me a couple questions. And he said to me, he says, Mr. Fry, he says, I think you're probably the kind of guy that, that really tries to obey those Ten Commandments. Now let me tell you something. He wasn't being complimentary, right? Uh, they don't, they do not fear God. These people, some of them just don't care. Well, you know, the Ten Commandments stuff is okay in concept, but you know. Here's the solution. You've got to educate the citizens on the Constitution and fundamental principles. If you guys don't know it, how are you going to know if they're violating it? You know, I was asked to speak at a Patriot New Year's Eve meeting a couple of years ago. And I'm driving with a family deal, right? So I'm driving down the highway. My son pops over the back seat. He says, Dad, do you know what the most popular sucker is in the world? I said, no, Dean. He's like 12. I said, no, Dean, I don't. He said, dum dum. I thought about it a second. I thought, man, that's really profound. You know, that's true. Dum-dums are the biggest suckers in the world. There's one going every minute. And if you continue to be dum-dums, you're going to be a sucker. That's it. That's the only solution to the problem. We created it. we got to fix it. Right? And if we don't, who's going to pay the price? Uh, our, kids. our kids. Now, I don't know about you, but my 12-year-old has not been responsible for anything that has been going on in the shape that we're in. I am. Because I sat on my butt for 40 years. I didn't care and I didn't want to be involved, right? And I'll be held to account for that. It was a moral problem that I got myself into. Don't do that. Make the change. Take back the states so they can uphold their duty and reign in the central government. They don't care about paper documents. They've exhibited that for 100 years. They don't care. Now here's some things you can do to get back control. Some people don't necessarily agree with this, but this is what you can do. But the bottom line is this. You've got to learn the Constitution. It's not very complicated. It really isn't. You've got to learn the fundamental rules of federalism so they're not always lying to you. All right? And you've got to learn allegiance and protection. What's responsible? That's the great firewall that protects our liberties, right? And if you don't understand it, how are you going to make, enforce it with them? And they know. You go ask one of your legislators, what's allegiance and protection? They won't know what you're talking about. I'll bet you money on it. They won't. One of the most important principles in our republic. Now, I had a gentleman, I've had this happen a couple of times. One of, one of the guys asked me after a presentation, actually it was after the debate with uh, the Kansas director. Uh, he says, well, Mr. Pryor, I think what you're trying to tell us is that, the, 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 that our politicians aren't upholding the oath to support the Constitution. Well, now, whose job is it to make them do that? And I said, well, sir, it's our job. He goes, well, we're not going to do that. What are we going to do then? And I said, you know what? It's a Jesus on the cross moment, right? It's a Jesus on the cross moment. When he was hanging up on the cross, he was between two criminals. And one of them mocked him. And the other one said, Jesus, forgive me. Now, what you're asking me is, what's going to happen to the guy that mocked Jesus? That was his chance. And he didn't take it. He mocked Jesus. I think he's probably going to hell. It's not my decision. So if we don't do our job, what's going to happen to us in the Republic and our liberty? It's going to go to hell. Right? But we can do something about it. We're more powerful than they are, right? But we've got to be smart. We can't be dumb-dumbs, right? To get control of the federal government, we've got to get control of the states. That's what the founders, that's the way they set it up. All of us together are not going to change the federal government. I cannot drive to their house 
There's what, 500 some of them, right, total? I can't drive to their house. I can't, I can't harangue them in meetings everywhere. I can't go to Washington. I, I go to Washington several times a year, but, I, but you know what? I can meet my, my legislators in the coffee shop. I can drive to their offices. I can go to their town hall meetings. And I've done that. And let me tell you, some of them, they get red in the face when they see me walking in. Oh, there he is again. Oh my God, he's going to ask me about what It's our job. We can do it. State nullification is that under the supremacy clause. Remember, I told you it was a nullification clause, right? And we've got 200 years of Supreme Court cases that agree with this. And in fact, Madison Jefferson wrote on this, and they agree. If they, Congress, passes and the president signs an unconstitutional enactment, what happens? It never becomes law. It never becomes law. It does, it's not null and void when the Supreme Court says it is. This is what the Supreme Court says. It never becomes law. It's never enforceable. Right? It, conserve, it, 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 it gives no benefit. It extracts no penalties. It's unenforceable. Right? It's automatic constitutional nullification. It has nothing to do with the states. But now, what's the state's obligation under their oath of office? Can they support? An unconstitutional enactment under their oath? What do they have to do under allegiance and protection? Because see, if they are the, the central government is acting on you outside the scope of the Constitution, it's an infringement. It's beyond their authority, an infringement of your rights. What's the duty under allegiance and protection of the states? To protect you. That means that they have to uh, uh, intercede, right? They have to get between you, interpose. They have to get between you and the federal government. Right? They have to say, stop. No, 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 no. That's their job, right? But you've got to make them do that. And you've got lots of goofy people out there, like the Tenth Amendment is one of them, that passes laws like in Kansas. We fought this all over the country. They, 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 they proposed a Second Amendment preservation act that Mr. Kobach supported and pushed. And what it did is it recognized that the, in essence, it recognized the federal government had the right to regulate firearms that moved in interstate traffic either before or after a commercial sale. Shall not infringe. And Kansas succeeded that, that the government had that ability, right? And that they could control uh, the personal travel with, with a weapon. The other thing that they did is they, they absolutely prohibit the state law enforcement from interfering with a federal agent coming into the state and enforcing a law that the state had already concluded was unconstitutional. Does that cause anybody a problem? You know, and I bitched about that. You know, what their their, their representative the tag part said, well, you want to get into a shootout with the feds? No. I don't want to get into a shootout with anybody, but let me tell you something. If you kick down my door and come in my house, I have a duty to take you on, right? I have a duty to protect my family. The state has the same duty. We can't support that kind of nonsense. We can't let our state support it. And they've done the same thing with NADA. They made the same restrictions. Passing laws in states that says the federal, the, the state law enforcement can't interfere with federal, a federal agent that's coming into the state to take you under arrest without a search warrant, without an arrest warrant, and hold you indefinitely. Oh my God, you know what that is? That, in, in European tradition, it's treason. It's absolute treason. Well, what would you call it if, it, if, if that is an application if the state defends your rights against the infringement of... The state, your... but the state doesn't do anything. It's automatic. See, the, the way it works, the, the way that they would have you believe is you have to go to your legislature and ask them humbly to nullify a law, right? 
and they can decide whether or not they want to use it. Just ignore the law. I mean, the only thing you're saying is you just ignore the law. I mean, somebody's. No, I'm not saying that. Where's the enforcement? The enforcement. The enforcement against an illegal law. Well, it depends on what the action is. If the federal government's coming in to arrest you without a, a an arrest warrant to hold you indefinitely, the enforcement is that they send the sheriff out that says, if you try to take this guy, we will arrest you. You have guns, we have guns. We don't want any problems, but we're being defensive. You're violating these guys' rights. All right? Well, that's been, that's been pretty close to happening already on a couple of occasions out west. But I mean, what I'm saying is that, that you're saying that it's the state's authority has the authority to tell the federal government to go fly a kite when they write an illegal law. They have a, yeah, they have a duty not to enforce it or participate in it. Right, right. That's so they, they, but they're not nullifying anything. Right? But that is nullification. It's constitutional nullification. The, the difference is this. You, under, under state nullification, you have to go to your state legislature and tell, ask them, please, will you nullify this federal law? That's not the way it works. They have an absolute duty to take action. You shouldn't be in there asking well, I'm for talking about I'm talking about it just a, a natural a, a natural uprising of the people and, and, uh, and having our legislature listening to us, which would be pretty rare, uh, <laughs> on the state level, and having them do what they're supposed to do, yeah. which would be to nullify a bad law. Well, again, the states have no ability to nullify, and if the law's already null, how are they going to nullify? They don't have to take don't even, they don't have to take an action. The only thing they have to do is uphold their duty to defend you. Which we had a bill uh, that got killed in committee, like every good sense. bill does in Tennessee, uh, uh, to tell the sheriffs that they would have to arrest the, the federal agent if they just like you said, and, and of course well, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't pass it. And see, of course, the the, 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 the sheriffs have a duty anyway. They don't need to pass the law to but that's, do it. That's and some true. sheriffs recognize that. But they follow the direction of the state, and if the state doesn't tell them to do it, they, they Well, you're right. But, but technically, they have that responsibility because we're under oath of the Constitution. And the very nature of the sheriff, if you look at the historical development, was to protect the sovereign, I, the sovereign's interest. I agree, but the key is in... in, in getting those people convinced okay. that that's what they're supposed to do. Right, education. Education and motivation. In the uh, Tennessee Department of Safety, and all this, all this, well, that would mean that they're appointed. Fusion Center? Sir? A fusion Center? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And they, they became more different. Yep. Now, for what I mean, it's not constitutional, but they have it in the hobby. It's not constitutional. They did it. Point being is that did that not take away because the state entity did not take away the authority of the law of the sheriff? Say that again. Did it not take away the authority of the local sheriff from the Tennessee Department of Safety joint department of homeland security? No. It didn't, it didn't impact the authority of the sheriff. And depending on whether or not you have a constitutional sheriff, if, if your constitution get it, you know, says we are going to have a sheriff, then it's a constitutional authority that they have. So they can't just pass a law. They have to do a constitutional amendment because the sheriff brings with him that common law authority that he has, which is, you know, this powerful. I mean, there's nothing magical about a sheriff except this, the one thing. Who does the sheriff answer to? People. The people. The people of the guy. Right. Who, does, who does the FBI answer to? The director who answers to the president. Who does the state police answer to? The commandant. And who's the answer to? The governor, right? It's all political. The sheriff answers to us. I just think it's a pretty ball there. Kind of push the thing to the ground. Well, but the problem is, you know, you got to understand the supremacy clause for what it is, and it's also a nullification clause. It's an automatic nullification clause. If they pass something that's unconstitutional, and see, under your oath, right? You have under your oath, you as a legislator or a city commissioner have to determine whether or not it's constitutional. You can't wait for a judge to do it. You gotta do it yourself, that's your duty. And it's not a big duty because, right, you just said you understand the constitution, and it's simple, right? The average person, right? So cities have an obligation to pass city ordinances that say our police officers 
will not participate, and if feds come in here and violate your rights, they will be arrested. We will not tolerate it. And the state has the same obligation. The county has the same obligation. But what they'll say is, well, that's a federal issue. But it has anything to do with us. Really? You don't think you're part of the federal government? What do you think that oath does? Your oath is the federal constitution. Make sure that the also a federal officer, in essence. You have a job to defend the constitution. It's simple. The, the amendments that mark any of the amendments are not relevant. They're just not relevant. And who controls the convention is not relevant. No matter what happens, do you think that Congress and the federal government, the central government, is going to obey the new constitution when they're not obeying this one and haven't for 100 years? Where's the logic in that? that that's not relevant. That's a diversion. And I did talk about such things as the balanced budget amendment. It's a farce. I'm telling you, they're not relevant. You know, I'm happy to talk to you later if you want to get into detail about some of them, but they're not relevant. That's fine. Have your federal delegation propose that and do it through Congress so everybody sees it in advance. We know exactly what the language is. And you can call your congressman and say, if you vote for this, I'm going to, I'm going to be after you. Or you say, if you don't vote for this, I'll be after you. If you go into one of these deals, it's blind. You do not know what's going to come out. I'm against the convention, but I, but I do think that, that conservatives who, who advocate this are fair-minded and legitimate, and they're not evil just because they, they support this. They're, you know, they're, you know they, they, we've got a reasonable disagreement among, among brother conservatives. We, I, I mean, you may, you may believe that, but other people, based on these facts, may come to a different conclusion than I have. Uh, Either they're not, they're, they're misinformed or uninformed, or they don't know this history. I mean, this history should make everybody nervous. I mean, these these big time uh, foundations have not stopped. They're the ones behind this. Was this Governor Rockefeller back in '73? Who was a senator? Why, why do they do Common Core? They do it because they get federal money. Why, why did they do the militia deal, which was unconstitutional and violated their oath, their, their duty and their business protection? For money. They got paid money. Why did they do the education? Why did they take education money, federal money? Feds don't have the ability, and the states don't have the, the authority to accept it. Right? It's unconstitutional. They have the duty not to do it. It's bribery. They're used to call those unfunded mandates. They don't call them that. Well, you know, there really isn't something such as an unfunded mandate, frankly. Of course not. What it is, is just like in Kansas, the governor uh, campaigned against Obamacare, right? He said it was unconstitutional, socialism is going to break the state, da 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 da. After he was elected, before he took office, he entered into an agreement with the federal government to accept $31.5 million, which was obligated the state to build Obamacare exchanges, etc. Right? It's that. And the strings are all over the place. It is money. It's power. And what he actually did was, the insurance commissioner was a very good friend of civilians, right? You know, Captain Civilians? I'm ashamed to say it, she's from Kansas. The wizard blew her out of there. Was a very good friend of civilians. So he, he did this to the, the insurance commissioner, right? When he took office, he then passed an executive order to restructure the state and took the money away from her. Well, guess who he gets a call from? From civilians. He says, hey, Deb, Sammy, huh? if you do that, you're not getting the money. I want a written letter from you that says you're going to reverse this and this is not going to happen. And it better be here by Friday at 5. And guess what? By Friday at 5, she had it. She had the money. Now, why did he want it, right? Why do you suppose he did that? And rather than let her control the 31.5 million, he wanted to control it to buy favors. All right? Because he had 31.5 million bucks in his pocket, and people were coming to him wanting a piece of it. 
That, that's the game that they play. Political favors. It's crazy. You know, I, I agree with you that the states need to stand up to the federal government. What I see in the state of Tennessee, and it's probably true across the nation, if we this year have a $36 billion state budget, 50% of it is controlled by the federal government. Yeah, Kansas and so when we do stand up to them, guess what they're going to do? They're going to start pulling the money. And that, <coughs> that's what keeps these politicians bowing down to the federal government every time. Yeah. Do you care if they pull the money? I don't care at all. I say, and let's do it. That's what needs to happen. This state needs to have sovereignty. What's going, to, what's, going to happen, what's going to happen once the feds lose that control, right? If, if all the states stop taking the money, right? Right. That's what we really oh, do. Yeah, yeah. And he told the governor told some representatives that went in there and said, "No, this is not a good deal." Right? Or Republicans and conservatives, and you're here in debt with the feds. No, come on. What are you doing? Yeah, well, you know, there's a billion dollars in federal money, federal dollars, we need to lose. Well, we need to do is stop the transfer of money to them in the first place. But that well, yes. yeah, and there's you know maybe some mechanisms to. To take care of that, I think they're getting ready to kick me off here. But uh, what is <laughs> we got well, well, some of it's from China, and the rest of it's coming from your kids and grandkids. All people, people. people in Madison County would be amazed at how much money this county was paid because of the Katrina uh, fiasco in New Orleans. We, you know, this county was paid. You know, every month had. Had uh, thousands and thousands and, of dollars. There's strings. Do you guys have regional planning uh, commissions or conferences yes. or committees yes. of government? Agenda 21. Do you want? Do you want to read, Do you know what those are? Regional governance councils. Do you know what those are? Do you know what they call them in Russia? They call them Soviets. Soviet means a conference of councils. That's what they are. And so the, 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 the federal government gets to bribe the cities and counties and take sovereignty from them. But the strings are tied now. Right. That's what's going on. All right. Uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody else. Yeah, this. Wait, let's take one last question right here. Well, I wanted to know, is there a connection between the Council of Governors and these um, federal regions that they want to break the country up into? Well, I mean, it's basically the same thing. There's lots of different names for them. Maybe we want to call them regional planning conferences or conferences of governors or you know, governing councils. I mean, it's, it's all the same thing. The whole point of it is to, to, to give more and more federal control and have the states give away the sovereignty and and do away they're doing away with the states. The states are becoming irrelevant. That's what that's what's going on. They're instituting all over the country these are these Soviets. We gotta stop them. We gotta call them what they are and say we're not gonna put up with them. That's what's going on. Now because you guys have been so good I've got our <laughs> Will not be a dun dun. I'll give you guys a sign. <laughs> Let's give uh, Richard a. Uh... <laughs> now, I think it's important that when we, uh, when, we, when we read about various information, it's always important to go back to what our, our founding principle is. Because sometimes we get into, you know, it's a logical argument, hey, that makes sense. Yeah, we gotta do something. Uh, man, things are a mess. But we want to go back to what our founding principles are. And don't change them because people aren't following them. Follow them. Figure out how to enforce the people to follow them. And, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know how many copies of the Mark Levin book that I received from various people when I was on the campaign last year, or two years ago, and um, yeah, when you read it, it sounds like, hey, we can, uh, uh, Supreme Court, we can do term limits, we can do the 17th, we can do, this. all these amendments sound great, but the mechanism to which that they want to do it is the problem. And that's what we have to get people aware of, because as we mentioned, I think, um, earlier, is that the state of Tennessee has already passed a balanced budget amendment petition. So the state of Tennessee was the 22nd state to pass a specific resolution to call for a, an Article 5 convention as a balanced budget. Of course, as Richard points out, uh, that doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean that it, it will stay 
if one is called, it takes 34 states to, to call a convention uh, or to petition Congress, and then they have to call one. Uh, but have, when, when you're confronted with this, what I found helpful was to go back and read Article 5 and say, now where is that? And they'll say, well, you know, historically this or that. You say, well, the Constitution is over 200 years old, so it's historical, and we're not following it. So why would they follow another historical example? They won't. And, and that's the whole point to make, is that the, the argument doesn't hold water, so to speak, and uh, we got to get the word out. Uh, one of the, in fact, uh, a fighter or an organization that fights against the Convention of the States, one of their members said, well, why should we, I mean, Tennessee's already done it. Why are you guys even holding that event down in Jackson? Well, if we had that attitude, why are we fighting anything? Right? We don't. A convention hasn't happened yet, so it's not too late uh, to to take action. It's not too late to inform the elected officials. Uh, Jerry Bangle personally went to the Capitol, and each person, each elected official he saw, he handed an invitation to this event, and we don't have one in in the audience. So as Richard Fry pointed out, it's either they're, they're not reading, right, they're getting information and they're not validating for themselves, or it's just uh, they're willingly going along with, with this stuff. And if we want to take our nation back, we got to fix what's broken, and what's broken is people are not following the instruction manual that they've been given. Yeah. So I would just want to say thank you again to Richard. Thank you guys for coming out.